For at least a century, witches have been prevalent in pop culture. 1939's The Wizard of Oz had the most significant impact on television and film, leading to a massive increase of witch and dark magic themed projects in Hollywood. But only white women got to be centered for these roles, despite witchcraft and other ritualistic practices being present in other cultures and ethnic groups. Specifically, black witches rarely got to be the focus in Hollywood. Hoodoo, later known as voodoo, is a set of spiritual practices, traditions, and beliefs created by West Africans that spread across the black diaspora through slavery and eventually changed over time with the influence of other cultures. The community would turn to practitioners for protection and healing. But once voodoo became mainstream, the practice got misconstrued and demonized and Hollywood attempted to bury or erase black witches. My friends over on the Modern Girls channel already did a video about the evolution of witches, so make sure you guys check that out. In this video, I'll be giving you a rundown of black witches on screen throughout history. I actually meant to upload this video during Halloween, but I didn't finish editing in time, so I thought I'd just move it to Black History Month. Better late than never, right? This is the evolution of black witches on screen. The first known portrayal of a black witch on screen is Old Mandy in 1934's Chloe, Love is Calling You. Played by famous African-American Broadway actress Georgette Harvey, Mandy is a black voodoo priestess from Louisiana who uses her abilities to get revenge on the white plantation owner she believes killed her husband. But Georgette's character was racially offensive and played into the mammy stereotype often perpetuated by the media during the Jim Crow era. The 1934 film Drums O Voodoo, also known as She Devil, also followed a Louisiana voodoo priestess and a minister joining forces to stop an evil pimp from corrupting a little girl. The film has a heavy presence of hoodoo and voodoo in its plot and is the first horror film to feature a primarily black cast. According to the New Orleans website, Voodoo first came to Louisiana with enslaved Africans who merged their religious rituals and practices with those of the local Catholic population. Voodoo was bolstered when followers fleeing Haiti after the 1791 slave revolt moved to New Orleans and grew as many free people of color made its practice an important part of their culture. Voodoo queens and kings were spiritual and political figures of power in 1800s New Orleans. The community turned to witches and voodoo priests to seek advice, protection, or assistance. And they also brought solace to grieving families. By 1936, another voodoo-themed film titled Wenga, starring actress Freddie Washington, had been made. Wenga centers a light-skinned Haitian woman named Cleely Gordon, who's a plantation owner. She falls in love with a white man named Adam, who came to Haiti to oversee his father's plantation. But he breaks her heart because although she passes as white, She's technically still black, and he believes people should only date within their race. You belong to me, Adam, and no one else but me. No, clearly. You belong with your kind. But I ask for so little, only to be with you. Oh, I'll be your slave, anything. I'm going to be married. Won't that make a difference? No. And it's very likely that something might happen to prevent your marriage. You're not by any chance threatening me. No. I'm warning you. After he chooses to be with a white woman instead, Cleely becomes jealous and turns to voodoo to retaliate. Filming took place in 1933 on location in Haiti, but was relocated to Jamaica after local Haitian voodoo priests opposed the film and threatened production with Wenga, ironically. Freddie's character plays the stereotypical tragic mulatto role, a common depiction of fair-skinned women of African-American descent who struggle to find their place among black and white people. She had played this role previously with her portrayal of Piola in the 1934 feature film Imitation of Life. A lot of fair-skinned women of African-American descent chose whiteness as their identity in order to escape racial discrimination during overwhelming bias against African-Americans. But off-screen, Freddie was never ashamed of or denied her black heritage. In Wanga, 
Adam's plantation overseer, Lestrange, is played by white actor Sheldon Leonard, which caused controversy with the black community. But due to Hollywood's Hayes codes prohibiting interracial couples on screen, producers realized that white viewers would take issue to a black man kissing Freddie Washington, who looks like a white woman. You must be mad to think you can win the love of that sort of white man. So I'm beginning to find out. He's going to marry Miss Langley. She's his kind. She's white. You think so? I'm white too. As white as she is. Then I you're black. Black, am I? Is this black? Or these? Or this? Forget this madness. Your white skin doesn't change what's inside you. You're black. You hear me? You're black. You belong to us. To me. Wenka was considered a step in the right direction for Hollywood, as black actors were given a lot of screen time, and Cleely's character was played by an actress that properly matched her identity. The film also featured Hollywood's first kiss between a black and white actor, and the film displayed interracial love and openly discussed race and identity. All of these things made Wenga too controversial for Hollywood, and it was not released in the United States until 1942. The film was remade into the 1939 film The Devil's Daughter to appeal to a black audience. As we all know, black people had limited opportunities in Hollywood, mainly playing stereotypical subservient roles or only being seen in race films until the latter part of the 20th century. So let's skip ahead to the 1970s. The blaxploitation cinema era that decade spawned many opportunities for black American actors regardless of subgenre, and they were taking on more principal roles in speculative fiction films when blaxploitation horror took off. In the 1960s, interest in voodoo exploded in the black community, and tourism in Louisiana increased. Majority of black horrors in the 1970s focused on black magic and voodoo. But this trope was eventually seen as a stereotype painting black women as vengeful beings who turned to voodoo for all of their problems. Black witches on screen weren't always using their power for good. And like I mentioned earlier, voodoo was never originally intended for evil. In the 1973 Blackula sequel, Blaxploitation star Pam Greer plays Lisa Fortier, who is chosen to lead a voodoo cult and she performs spells and uses voodoo dolls. She eventually breaks the curse placed on the prince, also known as Blackula. We also had characters like voodoo queen Mama Matress in the 1974 zombie film Sugar Hill, played by legendary actress Zara Cully. Mama Matress was recruited by a woman named Sugar to get revenge on her boyfriend's killers. Then came The Wiz in 1978. It's an all-black version of The Wizard of Oz, and black audiences finally got to see the black community depicted in a fantasy adventure musical. Dorothy, played by Diana Ross, encounters a few witches in the movie, just like the original novel. Miss One, the good witch of the North, gives her silver slippers and urges her to follow the yellow brick road to Emerald City. Glinda is the good witch of the South that causes the storm that brings Dorothy to Oz. And finally, Eveline, the wicked witch of the West, who seeks to capture Dorothy, take her silver slippers, and become the ruler of Oz. But the characterization and difference in the way each witch and the Wiz were depicted added to the never-ending conversation about colorism in Hollywood. The good witches were lighter-skinned and depicted as more feminine and dainty with great speech, while the wicked witch is depicted as a heavier dark woman with unappealing makeup, a wide prosthetic nose, and spoken ebonics, playing into the idea that darker women are more masculine, less educated, and envious. Which films and shows centering white women exploded in the 90s? Meanwhile, black witches were lagging far behind. 
The 1996 teen film The Craft attempted to sprinkle in a little diversity with the character Rochelle Zimmerman, played by Rachel True. But Rochelle's character is the only one who didn't get a backstory, so not much is known about her family or background. The only thing viewers know about Rochelle is that she appears to be one of the only black students at her school and is a victim of racist harassment from fellow swim team members. Rochelle was originally written for a white actress, but actress Rachel True still auditioned for the part and the racist storyline was written into the film once she was cast. But just like her on-screen character, Rachel was sidelined, excluded, and experienced discriminatory behavior during the press cycle for the craft. When I was cast in it, I remember seeing the new script and thinking, she was most, uh, Rochelle was bulimic to begin yeah. with. That was my original audition. Then they turned it to racism. And I remember thinking, and this is my young brain, not my adult brain, thinking, do they see blackness as a problem? But, you know, I, once I really thought about it when I got older, I thought, no, it's really good they had it in there. Oh, God, look, there is a pubic hair in my brush. Oh, no, wait, wait. That's just one of Rochelle's little nappy hairs. A year after the craft, the independent drama film Eve's Bayou hit theaters. Have you told anyone? Because if you tell it, I'm gonna kill you. I'll kill him for hurting you. I put his hair inside the mouth of the snake. You can't kill people with voodoo. Bad girl. You speak to my wife again, and I will kill you. It's a story about the Batiste, an affluent Southern African-American Creole family living in Louisiana during the early 1960s, and is told from the perspective of the youngest daughter, Eve, played by Journey Smollett. The film covers themes such as hoodoo, African-American ritualistic practices, and Southern Gothic traditions. Eve's Bayou was written and directed by Casey Lemons. The plot uses stories from her childhood trips to Louisiana, and each character is loosely based on relatives. In the film, Debbie Morgan plays Aunt Moselle, a known psychic and rumored black widow in the neighborhood who works as a hoodoo practitioner. Before her third husband's death, she had a vision about it in a dream. Her niece Eve eventually finds solace in her as she battles family issues. The legendary Diane Carroll played the local voodoo witch and fortune teller named El Zora that Eve and Moselle go to for answers. Lynn Whitfield's character, Roz, suspects her husband isn't being faithful, so she goes to El Zora for a reading, who then reveals to her that there is an unexpected solution for his infidelity. Eve later commissions her for a fatal voodoo spell on her father after her older sister, Cicely, revealed a secret about what he attempted to do to her one night while drunk. The African diasporic religion was being referenced a lot in film and television during the 90s, like in the 1991 independent film Daughters of the Dust, written, directed, and produced by Julie Dash. In the 1998 adaption of Toni Morrison's Pulitzer Prize winning novel Beloved, Fandy Newton plays the title character, who's a poltergeist of a baby killed by her mother to protect her from growing up in slavery. Beloved also casts spells to punish her mother and disrupt her family's household. In the 2000s, depictions of black witches became less about West African ritualistic practices and Caribbean folklore and became more whimsical, playing into all of the overdone pop culture witch tropes, like the use of spell books and crystal balls, most likely because the intended audience were teens and children. These characters, unsurprisingly, were often misrepresented, sidelined, or played a subservient role to support the main character. In the 2009 Disney animation, The Princess and the Frog, the character Madame O.D. is a voodoo queen and priestess who lives deep in the swamps of Louisiana with her pet snake Juju. The word Juju refers specifically to objects used in conjunction with spells or curses. But Madame O.D. uses her power to help Naveen and Tiana break the curse, performing the gospel number, Dig a Little Deeper. The 
Princess and the Frog also features a witch doctor using voodoo to turn the prince into a frog. And the entire film is a tribute to early New Orleans culture, being set largely in the French Quarter of the 1920s. In the past decade, we've seen a resurgence of traditional black witches on screen. Angela Bassett's portrayal of Marie Laveau in American Horror Story is the most notable black witch in recent years. The character is an unapologetically black hair salon owner who uses her abilities to protect her community. Marie Catherine Laveau is actually a real historical figure who was a well-known Creole voodoo practitioner, herbalist, and midwife in New Orleans. But in the series, she's portrayed as a vicious villain with murderous tendencies for innocent people, and the writers and producers got a lot of flack for it. The Coven season takes place in New Orleans and follows a coven of witches in training. It also features flashbacks to the Salem witch trials and the 19th century. In the series, Marie murdered Madame Delphine for torturing her enslaved boyfriend to death. Delphine's grave gets dug up 180 years later, and in present day, her and Marie are rivals who frequently exchange racial insults. By the end of the series, Marie is living in hell. The character Queenie, portrayed by Gabri Sidibe, is a human voodoo doll. Queenie eventually left their coven to join the voodoos with Marie Laveau, then ends up moving right back into the academy. After Angela Bassett's portrayal of Marie Laveau, there was a tiny revival of true black witches on screen. In 2019, writer and director Moon Ferguson released a supernatural fantasy web series titled Juju that centered three black girls who discovered they are all witches and are now adjusting to their newfound magic powers. Moon spoke with OKPlayer.com about white writers getting black witches wrong in recent years, saying, they just get it wrong. I feel like they just don't care to do the research. It's like they have no shame in being wrong. They just don't care. They have no interest in researching this magic. When you show white witches, you show them using good magic, but you also show them using bad magic for evil purposes. When it comes to African spirituality, we only see one side of it. We only see it as a savior trope. Even with Angela Bassett in American Horror Story, her character Marie Laveau, her whole thing was revenge. She used her magic for bad until she became the savior trope and the witch hunters were coming and the girls at the school came to her because her magic is supposedly stronger. But here goes another black character saving the white folks again and forgiving the white folks. Not to say that black characters can't be evil or can't be villains that are evil. I felt that if they would have just left Marie at that, it would have been fine. But they had to make her a black savior trope. The same with Bonnie of The Vampire Diaries. She was the savior. She lost everything. She had to sacrifice her whole family, her lineage, her magic. So I personally just want to see a little more care and nurturing. Do the research and show intention." End quote. And finally, we have Carmen in the Colombian streaming series Always a Witch. Carmen is a slave accused of witchcraft and burnt alive by the Inquisition in 1646 before reappearing on the beach of Cartagena in present day. The series is problematic for a number of reasons, but the main reason is the fact that they neglected the conversations surrounding race in Latin America and the lack of black characters in the series that jumps back and forth between slavery and present day. The series also features a romance between Carmen and the son of the family that kept her enslaved back in the 17th century. I think I speak for everyone when I say we are in dire need of a black witch revival with proper representation. That's all I have for this video today, but I really want to know in the comments who is your favorite black on-screen witch? Like this video and subscribe to BFTV for more content.